All right, well, welcome back to another one of these sessions. We are going to be spinning a few of these, Lord willing, talking about cults and false religions. And a question I want to ask is, who are the Jehovah's Witnesses? Are they a cult? What do they believe? Is what they teach scriptural and biblical on the essential matters of the Christian faith? I, I bring this up partly because uh, I preached on John chapter 1, and so I, it piqued my interest on this. But we've had also some Jehovah's Witnesses stop by our house uh, a couple times in the last few months a lady with her daughter, and then she came back with her husband a few weeks later. So I'm assuming they may come back again. And uh, I, I wanted to do a little bit of a, of a dive on trying to remember and think through what all it is they believe and teach. Uh, it all began in the 19th century where a lot of these offshoots of Christianity began, like Mormonism and a bunch of other sects and movements um, during this period of time. Charles Taze Russell is the founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And what you, what you really need to get one of these kinds of movements going is they oftentimes are sort of, uh, they're, they're playing off of Christianity, getting their, their strength and their boost from a kind of Christian framework that has a kind of credibility, but then they, they, they change the teachings dramatically. And what you need is you need a, an opening charismatic figure who's very persuasive, who, who can win a lot of people over, and this is what you have in Russell. But then you also need for these things to keep moving, you need a second player, a second individual to take over when the original person dies. And uh, they had that. They got that in Judge Rutherford, jo Joseph Rutherford, who took over the movement in 1916 when um, Charles Taze Russell died. Uh, Charles Taze Russell, the founder, grew up in the church. He had some issues with the doctrines of the Trinity and the doctrine of hell, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. Bruce Metzger, one of the uh, great New Testament critical scholars of the last generation. He said in 1884, the group secured a, a charter from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and adopted the, the name Zion's Watchtower Tract Society. That's 1884. And today they are in Brooklyn, New York. And as you can see here, uh, they've got this massive uh, publishing house here and with the backdrop of New York in the background there, uh, the Watchtower, and they've got the JW.org there on the screen and this uh, amazing background of New York City. But they are, I mean, I, I don't, I, I need to look these statistics up. The last thing I heard was that they are publishing 800,000 copies of their Watchtower magazine a day. So this is a copy. There's, th these are all over the place. You can find them almost anywhere. Uh, the Watchtower magazine, these really paper-thin little magazines, they are the most printed magazines in the world. Uh, th this one, which is a pretty recent one, this, well, this is from 2020. It says here, produced each issue 93,281,000 copies. Available in 369 languages, uh, the magazine The Watchtower honors Jehovah God, the ruler of the universe. It comforts people with the good news that God's heavenly kingdom will soon end all wickedness and transform the earth into a paradise. It promotes faith in Jesus Christ who died so that we might gain everlasting life and who is now ruling as king of God's kingdom. This magazine has been published continuously since 1879 and it is non-political. It adheres to the Bible as its authority. Uh, and then it'll have things like it'll have a cover and it'll say, what is God's kingdom? With, usually they, they're, they're very well known for these kind of painting kind of artwork that they use. And it's called the Watchtower, announcing Jehovah's kingdom. And then they'll have uh, a table of contents. Thy kingdom come a prayer repeated by millions of people. Why do we need God's kingdom? Who is the king of God's kingdom? When will God's kingdom rule uh, the earth? What will God's kingdom accomplish? Choose to support God's kingdom now. God's kingdom, what is it? And it just has very seemingly uh, helpful, interesting things. They have little diagrams and pictures and articles. Again, very often these paintings are very common on these kinds of things, and they'll have pictures, and they'll talk about all kinds of different issues, uh, God's kingdom, and they try to make it look practical and biblical and helpful. They're quoting Matthew 6, Matthew, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, uh, Acts chapter 17, Matthew 24. It's, it's saturated in Scripture on the back. Uh, they've got Scripture references to God's kingdom, Isaiah 9, Matthew 5, Luke 1, Daniel 2, Matthew 6, Matthew 6, Matthew 13. I mean, it just, it looks like, if you don't know better, it looks like just kind of a Christian magazine of some kind that talks a lot about the Bible and about practical Christian living. And so these things are easy to pick up, and you could be sitting around somewhere waiting on something in downtown Athens, and they've got a little display, and they hand you one, and, and off you go. But those come from here, printing hundreds of thousands of copies of Watchtower, and then the second most printed magazine in the world is Awake, which is also published by Jehovah's Witnesses, along with many, many countless books. According to their website, and I'm going to have a lot of screenshots from jw.org, uh, according to their website, with writing and publishing, we have published some 220 million Bibles uh, and about 40 billion with a B, 40 billion pieces of Bible-based literature. 
I mean, th this is a printing company that puts everyone else to shame. It's unbelievable. Uh, our publications are available in over 900 languages, not to mention the JW.org website, which uh, the, their missionaries nowadays point people to. Uh, when they come knocking on your door, if you have questions, they will point you to, to JW.org. Let's talk about some of the, the distinctives about what they believe. Now, you could start off with the less important stuff, and don't, don't get distracted by the less important stuff when it comes to Jehovah's Witnesses. Things like this. They believe Jesus died on a stake, a torture stake, not on a cross. Uh, they, they believe that you should not celebrate your birthday, at least generally speaking, because they say there's only two examples in the Bible of someone celebrating their birthday, and they're both bad examples. You have Pharaoh in Joseph's story celebrating his birthday when he has the one man hanged, and then you have uh, Herod celebrating his birthday when he has the, his, his niece dance provocatively in front of his men while he's drunk. So they say, okay, the only two birthday parties we got in the Bible are negative and pagan and wicked, so you should never celebrate your birthday. They also don't tend to celebrate Christmas and Easter. They, they want to commemorate the death of Jesus, but not uh, focus so much on, on the the other two, although there are some Jehovah's Witnesses who will still do that anyway. Don't get caught up on that kind of stuff. That, that stuff's not the important stuff. Let, let's get into some of the things that matter here, uh, that really matter. Th they reject the eternal deity of the Son, of Jesus, and they also claim the Holy Spirit is not a person but a force. This is where you're getting into extraordinarily basic fundamental issues. When you talk to Jehovah's Witnesses, I, they came to my door. Uh, I opened, I was, I was uh, home with my kids alone. Kelly was out uh, doing something, so I opened the front door, and uh, uh, I'm opening the glass door, and my daughter Maggie, who's two, she uh, has a balloon, and she drops the balloon and like falls into the door. The door swings open, hits a giant clock we have on the other side of the door. Clock falls on the ground, crashes, and I'm like, hey, nice to see you guys. That was, that was kind of my opening moment. And I, I said to the, to the, it was a woman and her probably 20-something-year-old daughter, I said, and she had her iPad out with Jehovah's Witness uh, Bible translation up. She had her interlinear Greek up from the Jehovah's Witnesses, which I've got. I, I downloaded the app, and I've got it uh, somewhere on here. I've got the JW Library app, which is what she had. I, I believe that's what she had up while we were talking. And she was ready to talk about the Bible. I said, you guys, I said, I'm a, I'm a Baptist minister. I said, you guys uh, don't believe in the Trinity. Is that correct? And she said, yeah, we don't believe in the Trinity. And, and that is confirmed on their website. Again, this is straight off their website, a screenshot from yesterday. What is the Holy Spirit? The Bible's answer, the Holy Spirit is God's power in action, His active force. And they, they quote Scripture, God sends out His Spirit by projecting His energy into any place to accomplish His will. And they talk about the word pneuma here and the Old Testament word ruach, uh, the words for spirit, breath, or wind. Um, Jesus, who is Jesus Christ? He is the Savior, the Son of God. And then they love quoting uh, Colossians 1.15, the firstborn of all creation. In other words, they would argue that that verse means firstborn of all creation, uh, the prototokos, the, 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 the proto, the firstborn uh, of all creation. They would say that, that means that Jesus is the first created being. So uh, this, this may shock you if you don't know much about Jehovah's Witness theology. If you do, this won't be a surprise. But it says here, as a created being, he, Jesus, is not part of a trinity. The Father is greater than I am, said Jesus in John 14, 28. Uh, Jesus lived in heaven before coming to earth, and after his sacrificial death and resurrection, he returned to heaven. No one comes to the Father except through him. So they argue that Jesus is the first and greatest created being of God. They believe that God the Father only created one thing directly, and that is Jesus. But he wasn't called Jesus before the world was made. He was called Michael. And yes, that means Michael the archangel. You look on their website, who is Michael the archangel? You're not going to believe this. If you've not heard this before, it will be a surprise. The spirit creature called Michael is not mentioned often in the Bible. At times, individuals are known by more than one name. For example, the patriarch Jacob is known as Israel uh, as well as Jacob. The apostle Peter is also known as Simon. Likewise, the Bible indicates that Michael is another name for Jesus Christ before and after his life on earth. And when you look at the scriptural support for that, it is, it is, it is just obviously uh, terrible. They use things like 1 Thessalonians 4, the Lord himself will descend uh, with the cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead, the dead in Christ will rise first. And they say, see, look, the Lord will descend, that's Jesus, he will descend with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel. So it must be Jesus' voice, and he's called the voice of the archangel, and we know from Daniel the archangel is Michael, so therefore Jesus is Michael before and after uh, his, his life on earth. I'm sorry, that is horrifying logic. I mean, I think you'd almost have to say Jesus was also a trumpet, if you're going to take that in the literal sense. Jesus will descend from heaven with a cry of command, the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God. 
if we're just going to say that anything that follows that has got to be Jesus, then the trumpet is also, Jesus is also the trumpet, or he's like a trumpet. Uh, that, that's not what's being said in that text at all. Uh, there is no text that says the Michael is Jesus or Jesus is Michael. This is something that they have invented and put into the text, uh, and they believe that J Jesus was originally Michael, and then God created everything through Michael. So Michael, who was Jesus before his birth uh, through Mary, he was Michael, the archangel, and Jesus created everything uh, else that has come into being outside of himself. So God created G Jesus or Michael directly, then Michael or Jesus created everything else, uh, and that's how God made everything through him. Jesus' own words showed that he would not be resurrected with his flesh and blood body. This is another astonishing teaching from JW.org. Uh, he said that he would give his flesh in behalf of the life of the world as a ransom for mankind. If he had taken back his flesh when he was resurrected, he would have canceled that ransom sacrifice. This could not have happened, uh, though, for the Bible says that he sacrificed his flesh and blood once and for all time. So you see here, Jesus' own words show that he would not be resurrected with his flesh and blood body. The, the Jehovah's Witnesses deny that Jesus was bodily, physically, corporeally raised literally from the dead on uh, Easter morning, on Resurrection Sunday morning. I mean, this is, this is a, another whopping, uh, massive difference between this uh, view and the biblical Christianity view. So not only is Jesus a created being, which is fundamentally a different religion, uh, but he's also someone who, when he died, his body was annihilated. His body was gone. His physical body ceased to be. It was gone, and he was raised, not, not raised in any sort of physical bodily way, but he was given a spiritual presence, and he when, he, when he made his resurrection appearances, he was not actually showing a physical body. You say, is that really what they say? Yes. If Jesus was raised up with a spirit body, how could his disciples see him? How do you account, Jehovah's Witnesses, for the resurrection appearances of Jesus? Well, Spirit creatures can take on human form. Spirit creatures. That's what Jesus is now. He's, he's not a raised physical human man, uh, truly God, truly man. No, he is a spirit creature who can take on human form. For example, angels uh, did this in the past. They even ate and drank with humans, Genesis 18 and 19. However, they, they, they still were spirit creatures and could leave the physical realm. That is true of angels, but it's not true of Jesus bodily ra raised from the dead. Next thing, they say after his resurrection, Jesus, now look at this. After his resurrection, Jesus also assumed human form temporarily, just as angels had previously done. Wow, that, that is a massive difference from the biblical view of a bodily, physical, literal resurrection of Jesus. Uh, he assumed human form temporarily, just like angels can do. In other words, he doesn't actually have a real uh, physical bottle, body that's been raised from the dead. Uh, you know, he just, he takes on a temporary appearance of a human form like angels used to do and can do uh, from time to time. But as a spirit creature, though he was able to appear and disappear suddenly, the fleshly bodies that he materialized were not identical from one appearance to the next. Thus, even Jesus' close friends recognized him only by what he said or did. This is a horrifying false teaching. And as you know, Jesus appeared to Thomas, and in John 20, he showed the nail marks, and Jehovah's Witnesses acknowledge that. And they say, yeah, the nail marks were simply uh, made to look like and to resemble those of his body that a few days ago when he had died. But those were not real nail marks in a real physical body. They were merely a spirit body taking on a temporary form, mirroring the, 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 the body that he had. I'm saying, no, no. The whole point of the nail prints is it's, it's the same wrist. That, that raised wrist that Jesus held out to Thomas was the same wrist physically that was nailed to the cross. Yes, it's been renewed. It's been resurrected, but it is the same. It, it, it is connected. There's a continuity between the body that was crucified and the body that was raised from the dead. Otherwise, you can't make sense out of that. And Jehovah's Witness response simply is not true to what Scripture is teaching. So, what we believe, God, this is again off their website, God is not a trinity. So if you want to know one thing about Jehovah's Witnesses, you've got to know this. This is it. This is the center of, of the false teaching of what they promote and believe. The July 1882 issue of Zion's Watchtower. So again, the Watchtower, this is the 2020 edition. We're quoting here the 1882 edition. These things have been printed for quite a while now. And um, here's what it says. So this is nothing new to their teaching. This goes back to the beginning of their movement. Quote, our readers are aware that while we believe in Jehovah and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, we reject as totally unscriptural the teaching that these are three gods in one person. Now, let's be clear. We also reject this. No Trinitarian believes that we believe that there are three gods in one person. We don't believe that. We, are, we, we agree that that's wrong. But then they say this, as some put it, one God in three persons. Now, this is what we believe. 
This is, this is basic Trinitarianism that's been affirmed for 2,000 years of church history. Uh, even Catholics and Orthodox Christians uh, would, would agree with this, although we're going to have fundamental gospel differences with both of them on other issues. I'm going to talk about Catholicism uh, on a coming session, Lord willing, and I'm going to show you that they teach a very different gospel than the one that the Bible teaches. But before we get to that, the Trinity, one God, three persons, they say, no, that's not what the Bible teaches. That's not true. So remember, in Jehovah's Witness theology, Jehovah is God the Father. He is truly God. Then you have Jesus, who's a lesser God, the first created being who created everything else. So you have the Holy Spirit, who is not a person, but an impersonal force. Let me just mention here, the Holy Spirit is an impersonal force, really. They'll mention things like Genesis uh, 1, verses 2 and 3, where the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the deep, and how the word for Spirit in the Old Testament and New Testament can mean breath or wind as well, which is true. But in the New Testament, you see things like this. Jesus speaks of the Spirit as He, not it. He will come to you. He will comfort you. He will remind you of all that I said. He will be your paraclete, your comforter, your encourager, your counselor. Uh, we're also told in Ephesians, and also Ephesians is echoing the book of Isaiah, Isaiah says that the, that the people of Israel grieved God's Holy Spirit. Ephesians says, Paul says, do not grieve the Spirit of God. You cannot grieve an impersonal being. You cannot grieve an inanimate being. You cannot grieve gravity, an impersonal force like gravity. You can't grieve it. You, you can't provoke it. You can't, uh, you can't do anything like that because it's an it. It's not a he. But the Holy Spirit is a he. He, I will send him to you. He will comfort you and encourage you. He will show you all these things. He will guide you into all truth. And you can grieve him. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. We're also told in the book of Acts chapter 5, the, the beginning verses there when Ananias and Sapphira lied to God, uh, we're told that they lied to the Holy Spirit. And then Peter says, how could you do this thing and lie to God? So the Holy Spirit and God are put on the same level as one another. Also, you've got the, uh, the Great Commission, the end of Matthew's gospel. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, into all uh, the world. Go into all nations and baptize them in the name, singular, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptize them in the name, singular, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Again, three persons, one God. Another one that was pointed out to me that I hadn't thought about recently is in Galatians, the introduction there. Listen to these words. This is quite something to think about. This is what, this is what Paul says. To the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you hear that? Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's putting Jesus on the same level as the Father. Or uh, how about a little bit later in the text, uh, Paul says this. Paul says he did not receive the gospel from man. Listen to this. This is Galatians 1.11. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel, for I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, you notice here, Jesus is placed in a different category from just a normal human being. Paul says, I didn't receive the gospel from man. It's not man's gospel. I didn't get it from a man. I got it from a revelation through Jesus Christ. In other words, he's putting Jesus on the same level as God. He's putting him outside the category of a mere human and putting him in another. And there's many, many other texts we can look at, and we'll look at some more in a, in a moment here. Here are other distinctives of Jehovah's Witness theology. Again, off their website, what we believe. This is important. There is no eternal torment in a fiery hell. They do not believe in eternal hell. They quote uh, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Quoting the Watchtower from 1882, quote, how clear and simple is this statement? How strange it is that so many who profess to receive the Bible as the Word of God persist in contradicting this positive statement and affirm that they believe and that the Bible teaches in the wages, that the wages of sin is everlasting life and torment. Now, just notice here, there's a little bit of an equivocation going on here because they are taking this phrase, which Jesus uses, they're, 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 they're using a double sense of the word life. Jesus says you can either go to way to eternal punishment or you can go away to eternal life. Uh, zoe is the word for life and ionios is the word for everlasting in that verse. Zoe, ionios, everlasting life. And they say, look, the Bible doesn't say the wage of sin is everlasting life and torment. It says it's death. Yes, but the Bible also talks about the second death. 
Revelation 20, the lake of fire. The, 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 the torment does not stop. It goes on day and night forever and ever. Day and night forever and ever. They have no rest. The, the Satan, the beast, the false prophet, the, 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 the torment, uh, the, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day or night. Th that's the language of, of, of the New Testament. Their worm does not die. Their fire is not quenched. They're an abhorrence to all flesh. Jesus says in Mark chapter 9, Isaiah 66 is the root of that verse. Their, their worm will not die, etc. But you have here, the, life doesn't mean life with God. He mean, they, life means being in existence, existing. Yes, they will exist forever in hell, but it's not called eternal life. It's called eternal death in that sense. Do Jehovah's Witnesses feel that they are the only people who will be saved? This is a bit of an interesting teaching as well. No, many millions who, live in century, who lived in centuries past and who were not Jehovah's Witnesses will have opportunity for salvation. The Bible explains in God's promised new world, there is going to be a resurrection of both the righteous and the unrighteous. Additionally, many now living may yet begin to serve God, and they too will gain salvation. You hear that? In any case, it's not our job to judge who will or won't be saved, etc. So they're saying that, they're, that even after resurrection on the last day, people will still have a chance to be saved in this system, but no one ends up in hell. At the worst, you get annihilated. You cease to exist, and that's, that's the worst that could happen. Can you lose your salvation? They are very clear on this. Yes, you can. Yes, just as a person was saved from drowning, could fall or jump back into the water, a person who's been saved from sin but fails to keep exercising faith could lose out on salvation. So yes, you can lose your salvation in Jehovah's Witness theology. Let's get into some of the weird, even the weirder, stranger things. This is, again, a, a, a freeze frame off their website. You can zoom in on it or, or freeze frame it on YouTube if you want to look at that more carefully. This is a really confusing one. I'm going to go really fast, and it may not make sense. It doesn't really make sense, I don't think, in general. But they talk about Nebuchadnezzar's uh, dream where uh, there's an enormous tree that's chopped down in Daniel 4. It says seven seasons or times will pass and your kingdom will be given to yours again. That represents the fact that there's going to be initial fulfillment and Nebuchadnezzar loses his mind and goes insane uh, for seven either literal years or seven seasons, seven times, and then he re restores his sanity again. And then they argue that there's a larger fulfillment of that story that takes place on, in world history. I don't agree with this, but that's what they say. This is based, I think, on no real substantial argument. But that's what they say. By the way, Dealing with pro prophetic stuff in the Bible without any sort of guardrails means you can make the Bible predict anything at any time. Just, just know that. You just start playing with numbers, and you can fall out on any date you want. And here's what happened. Uh, Charles Taze Russell looks at it like this. Larger fulfillment. Israelite kings who represented God's rule, what's going to happen is they're going to be destroyed by Babylon. And the argument goes like this. It's a complicated argument, but Babylon begins its destruction of Jerusalem in October, they argue, of 607 B.C., which is about right. That's when Daniel would have been shipped away and others, and then they don't destroy the temple until 586 B.C., but the, it begins in about 607 B.C. And here's what they argue. They argue that, uh, there is, that Revelation talks about a three-and-a-half-year period, which is called 1260 days, 1260 days. And they argue that if you put... Uh, Two of those periods together, you get the seven seasons or the seven periods of time that Nebuchadnezzar was crazy. And they argue that lines up with the Revelation three and a half plus three and a half. In which case you get 2,520 days across all of the seven times or seasons. Now, they argue that since nothing happened, uh, literally seven years after the, the initial takeover of Jerusalem, that, the, that it must not be a, a prophecy that refers to 2,520 days, but it must be referring to years because oftentimes or sometimes days can represent years. And there's an example of that in Ezekiel, I believe it's chapter 4, which they'll point to. So now we're talking about a 2,520-year period based on the Nebuchadnezzar story, which doesn't make any sense to me, but that's what they say. And they argue that this prophecy must begin. The, click, the ticking clock of these years must begin when? It must begin when Jerusalem was beginning to be taken over by, by Babylon in 607 B.C. Um, and then they, they go, okay, let's, let's chart forward. If you begin there and you go forward 2,520 years, you're going to end up in a certain date, and that date is the year 1914 A.D. They actually use uh, C.E., which I find interesting. But, so 1914 A.D., and they argue that, that this was the initial prediction was that Jesus was going to return in some vivid, uh, dramatic fashion in the year 1914. Now, that happened to be the year that World War I began, but Jesus did not come back in a physical, visible way, and so you immediately see the signs of false prophecy taking place at this point, because Charles Taze Russell and uh, Judge Rutherford and others, they're pointing to this date as saying, this is when Jesus is going to come back, uh, and the world is going to come to an end, and Armageddon is going to happen, and then, of course, it doesn't happen, although a world war begins, it does not end the world, and so they have to correct the embarrassment of their false teaching or their false prophecy here. Let me quote a Gospel Coalition article. They believe that Jesus is the king of God's kingdom in heaven, that he began ruling in 1914. A relatively small number of people, you may have heard of the 144,000, uh, 144,000 will be resurrected 
to live with Jehovah in heaven and rule with Jesus in the kingdom. Originally, they took the 144,000 from Revelation chapter 7 and 14, uh, and they, they, were, they, they said that this refers to all Jehovah's Witnesses who will be truly saved. But then they outnumbered the 144,000, so they began to, it seems like they began to tweak what they were saying about this, saying that this is actually just a, a number of people uh, that is going to rule in, in heaven with Jehovah, but there will also be others who rule on a new earth. Continuing the quote, they believe that God will bring billions back from death by means of a resurrection and that many now living may yet begin to serve God. They too will gain salvation. We saw that earlier. However, those who refuse to learn God's ways after being raised to life will pass out of existence forever. They will not suffer a fiery hell of torment. Bruce Metzger, the course of history after 1914 proved several of Russell's prophetic calculations and confident deductions to be erroneous. Now remember, um, De, uh, the book of Deuteronomy Chapters 13 and 18 tell us how to evaluate a prophet or someone claiming to be a prophet. I don't believe prophets exist anymore today because I'm a cessationist of that, and that's in another video on our website if you want to go back and find that. But whether you're a continuationist or not, the evaluation of prophecy is whether what they say comes true or not. Daniel 13 is clear about this, and Daniel 18, if what they say does not come to pass, they are a false prophet. In the Old Testament context, they were to be put to death. In the New Testament context, they were to be excommunicated or kicked out of the church. That would be a way of looking at it. And what we find is that his prophecy is in error. He is a false prophet. So, for example, in editions before 1914, uh, editions of their, of their writings, uh, the following declaration was made, quote, that the deliverance of the saints must take place, now look at this, this is, what, this is what they wrote, the deliverance of the saints must take place sometime before 1914 is manifest. Just how long before 1914 the last living members of the body of Christ will be glorified, we are not directly informed. Okay, that's what they said before 1914. But then a few years later, in the 1923 edition, they had to change the embarrassing false prophecy. So notice, they say it's, the deliverance can take place sometime before 1914. Well, 1914 came and went, and it hadn't happened, so they had to edit their writings. In the 1923 edition of the same volume, the embarrassing statement was changed to read, quote, that the deliverance of the saints, here it is, must take place very soon after 1914. So we just changed the word from before to after. Just how long after 1914, the last living member of the body of Christ will be glorified, we are not directly informed. So here you have a false prophecy in the, the pre-1914 edition that was then just simply changed in the 1923 edition so that they could get rid of the embarrassing false prophecy. Here's, again, a, a screenshot from one of the original writings from uh, the time period before 1914, before 1914 and 15. Uh, the original version of this, well, it's too complicated to, to go through every facet. Let me just read part of it. So, the battle of the great day of God Almighty, Revelation 16, 14, that's the battle of Armageddon, the, 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 the final judgment of God, which will end in A.D. 1915. The original version of this article, I was going to say, originally said it was going to take place in 1914, and then this was rewritten in the, the, the following year to say, no, it's going to actually happen in 1915, and then it didn't happen then, so then they had to change it again. You see, what, see what's happening here? Signs of clear false prophecy. So, Armageddon. Revelation 64, the great day of God Almighty, which will end in A.D. 1950, 15, uh, with the complete overthrow of, Earth, of Earth's present rulership is already commenced. So maybe he's looking at the beginnings of World War I and saying, hey, this is what I'm talking about. The World War I, this is the Battle of Armageddon, and it may have certainly looked that way, but it was not the very end. It was not Armageddon. So they say the, it will be the complete overthrow, complete overthrow of Earth's present rulership. Uh, let's look at what they wrote. Uh, in 1914 when some of these things were beginning to not take place. This is, again, November 1st, 1914, Watchtower Magazine. So this is after the date that they already said these things were going to originally happen and they weren't happening. Here's what they wrote. The end of the time of the Gentiles. Quote, studying God's Word, we have measured the 2,520 years, the seven symbolic times, from the year 606 B.C., and have found that it reached down to October 1914, which has come and gone because he's writing this in November 1st of that year. As nearly as we were able to reckon, look in red here, we did not say positively that this would be the year. We did not say positively that this would be the year. Well, yes, yes, they did. They said that many times and in many ways. <laughs> yes, they did. We merely left everyone to look at the facts of history and reckon for himself. Would this date be the time or would it be some other date, we asked. Many of us concluded that as far as we could see, October this year would show the end of the Gentiles, lease of power, etc. So when this came and went and it wasn't working out, they ended up saying Jesus did come back. He did come back in 1914, but it was not physically and visibly in any sort of way. Not that Jesus has a physical body, but he didn't come back in any visible way. He instead been reigning in heaven starting in 1914. 
Here's another uh, one of their documents. And this is what uh, Ruther, uh, excuse me, uh, what, what Russell, Charles S. Russell says about himself. Quote, no, the truths I present, this is what he's saying about himself, the truths I present as God's mouthpiece were not revealed in missions, visions or dreams, nor by God's audible voice, nor at all at, uh, nor all at once, but gradually since, uh, so let's see here, since 1870 and especially since 1880, Neither is the, this clear unfolding of truth due to any human ingenuity or acuteness of perception, but to the simple fact that God's to, due time has come. And if I did not speak and no other agent could be found, the very stones would cry out. So he is claiming to be speaking truths as God's very mouthpiece. If he's God's mouthpiece and he's speaking back then, why did he get so many things wrong? Metzger again, quote, not all of Rutherford's corrections, however, were made as, okay, so let me, let me, let me make a point here before we get lost. So remember, uh, Charles Taze Russell died in 1916, just a couple years after his embarrassing false prophecies about 1914. He died. He was replaced by Judge Rutherford. And when Judge Rutherford took over, he actually made a few very clear disagreements with the previous leader of, uh, and the founder of Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, he, he stepped, they didn't call themselves that at the time, but he, he stepped away from him and said, okay, he was wrong about one big thing. And there's a weird thing. Charles Taze Russell thought that God had left uh, divine revelation in the structure and shape and the whatever all of the pyramids of Giza, particularly the, the Great Pyramid of Giza. And he thought there was something about the stones and the structure, the shape and the size that it hid secret revelations from God about the future of the history of the world. If that sounds nuts to you, yes, that is crazy. And uh, Judge Rutherford strongly and even publicly disagreed with the founder on this issue. He knew it was so out to lunch that he said, no, that's not true. So so Rutherford made corrections. Some of them were subtle. Some of them were very direct. This one, he, he directly disagreed. So here's what Metzger says. Not all of Rutherford, this is the guy who took over for, for Russell, not all of Judge Rutherford's corrections, however, were made as unobtrusively as those just mentioned. Another of more, more basic significance was rectified publicly. So what did Judge, Judge, Judge Rutherford say about the founder, Russell? Russell had worked out an elaborate theory that certain measurements of the Great Pyramid of Egypt disclosed the whole history of the human race. Yeah, that's correct. And the time when Jesus would appear again on earth. Go Google the, 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 the tombstone of, of, of Charles Taze Russell, and you'll see that there was a giant pyramid right next to his, his, where he was buried, connected to all this stuff. And I think it was taken down just last year or two years ago in 2021 is what I read. But you can see that to this day. You can see videos of people standing next to it because he was obsessed with the Great Pyramid of Egypt, thinking God had told secrets about the human history and about when Jesus would appear again through that pyramid. And even Judge Rutherford disagreed with the founder on that. In 1929, however, Rutherford officially condemned any, att any attempt to find God's will outside the Bible. So this is what, uh, 13 years after the death of the leader? So Judge Rutherford says, okay, don't try to find God's will from the pyramid or anywhere else out there in your cereal bowl, the clouds in the sky. No, no, no. Uh, you should not try to find God's will outside the Bible. So you will notice today that Je uh, Jehovah's Witnesses have, a, have at least in lip service, at least by what they say, they have a high view of the Bible. They believe the Bible is God's inspired word. They believe it is true in what it teaches. Mormons believe more strongly in the corruption of Scripture. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that most modern translations are very corrupt, but they'll still use the King James, maybe the New King James. They might use the, uh, I think it may be the American Standard Version from like 1901. There's a few translations they'll use a little bit, but they have their own translation that we'll talk about in a second. But they, they at least claim to have a high view of Scripture, which is important to use in conversation. If they claim that the Bible is God's Word, then use the Bible all the more so when you talk to them. I think we should use the Bible with anybody, no matter what they believe about the Bible. We should use it because it's the power of God for, for salvation. But it says here, and he, de uh, he deprecated Russell's interpretation of the pyramid. Uh, as a result, many followers left the movement. So in 1929, they, they had followers leave the movement. You can see the, the movement split in different ways, and the Jehovah's Witnesses became the title that took the movement uh, in the long run and has taken over today. By the way, today, the Jehovah's Witnesses number around 8 million worldwide, and there are well over a million Jehovah's Witnesses in the United States today. Uh, they don't meet in churches. They think that, and they're partly, this is one of those little quirks where they're partly right and then just, but it doesn't, they're, they're also not particularly helpful. They, they think that the word church is refer, referring to the people of God. So they don't call their buildings churches because they think that's confusing. I, okay, there's, there's a degree of wisdom in that. I can see what they're saying there. But then they call them kingdom halls. Uh, again, don't get caught up on a debate about whether we should call churches churches or kingdom halls because that's not the main point here. That's not the main issue to talk about. Okay, Metzger continues. 
Another innovation was the adoption of the name Jehovah's Witnesses, a designation proposed by Rutherford at an international convention of members held at Columbus, Ohio in 1931. So they lost people in 1929 when he disagreed with the founder. But then Judge Rutherford, just a few years later, 1931, so two years later, he then suggested the, the title Jehovah's Witnesses as the name for their movement, and that's the title that has been kept to this day. Now, with all that in mind, and I'm sure there's a lot that you could ask questions about further, and uh, you can look stuff up online. There's a lot of good videos of Christians talking to Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, a lot of conversations you can look at to, to know more about that. I want to talk about some of the controversial parts of how they deal with their Bible. So, I mentioned the Watchtower magazine and Awake, right? We, we know about this. But they also have their own translation of the Bible, the New World Translation of the Scriptures. And the first uh, version of this came out with just a New Testament. I think it was in the 50s maybe. I, I won't get the dates right. 40s or 50s. They updated it. Maybe it was in the 60s. Then they updated it in their 80s a couple of times. Then they updated it in 2006. And then they updated it again just more recently, I think the 2013 edition. I don't even know which one this is. This may be a 19, this may be a 2006 edition or earlier. This is a 1984 edition that I have here. So there, there's, there's different editions and there are changes. I watched a video of a guy taking through some of the controversial verses. He literally, with a camera, looks at each, he has all the different versions of, the, of this Bible uh, in front of him. And he, go, he zooms in with his camera on each one and shows how they change and change back and change forward different interpretive controversial texts about Jesus as they make changes over time. So let's get into some of the big deals that we deal with here. I talked about this one in church on Sunday in the sermon. John 1, one of the most important texts in all the Bible, no doubt about it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So here you have a crystal clear text that says the Word was God, and there's no question because verse 14 says the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and then it says it mentions Him being Jesus Christ. So the Word is Jesus, and here we're told the Word was God. So that is an unequivocal statement uh, that the Word was with God, with God, so there's a distinction of person. The Word was with God, not the same person, God's eternal fellow, and the Word was God, God Himself, truly divine. So here you have the very makings of the doctrine of the Trinity. There is plurality within the Godhead, yet there's only one God, and the Word Himself is God, but also distinct from the Father. Very, very strong on that. How do the Jehovah's Witnesses translate it? Well, I'll use the, the, the 2013 edition of the New World Translation. In the beginning, the word was, well, no, actually, they, they switched it. it used to, their older translations used to say, in the beginning, the word was. The 2013 changed it to, in the beginning, was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was a God, lowercase g. The word was a God, lowercase g. Now, the Jehovah's Witness website says about the use of the word God, the Greek word is theos in John 1.1, 1, 1. in the first occurrence, the word God uh, the word was with God. So the word God there, theos, is preceded by the Greek definite article. The Greek definite article, which is like what we would call the in English. While the article does not appear before the second occurrence, the word was God. Uh, that has no definite article. The word Jesus Christ did have a beginning, they conclude. The Watchtower says, quote, the word who became flesh was God's first creation and was then used by his father to carry out all further creative work. And you like my typo there with a random ING. Uh, you're welcome for that. that. That's a little gift for you. Make sure you're still awake and paying attention. Uh, Bruce Metzger, he is one of the great uh, textual scholars, uh, again, of the last generation. He knows the Greek uh, as well as anybody. Uh, quote, in Greek grammar, nouns may be definite for various reasons, whether or not the Greek definite article is present. So let's get into the, we're going we're to get into Greek confusing craziness. This may be the time you want to turn this video off for the rest of your life and never come back. But I'd encourage you to stick with me here. And then I think I'm going to get to something much more simple and straightforward in a few minutes. So if you can get through the next few minutes, uh, I think there'll be a payoff. So we're talking about Caldwell's rule in Greek. Here we go. This is quoting Bruce Metzger. Dr. Ernst, uh, Ernest uh, Caldwell of the University of Chicago pointed out in a study of the Greek definite article that a definite predicate nominative has the article when it follows the verb. It does not have the article when it precedes the verb. The opening verse of John's gospel contains one of the many passages where this rule suggests the translation of a predicate as a definite noun. I'm going to explain this in a second. 
The absence of the article before theos does not make the predicate indefinite or qualitative when it precedes the verb. It is indefinite in this position only when the context demands it. The context makes no such demand in the Gospel of John, for this statement cannot be regarded as strange in the prologue of the Gospel, which reaches its climax in the confession of Thomas, my Lord and my God. So here it is. I'm just going to put the Greek words on the screen because you need to know this. I mean, I think you need to know this. Um, I'm not a Greek scholar, but these are verses that I have spent time uh, studying in the Greek because they're so significant and so important, especially on this debate. So you ready? Here we go. If you can see the screen, if you're listening, then uh, it's going to be even harder. But if you can see the screen, you should be able to see the Greek words up here. And I'll, 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 I'll try my best here to, to talk through this a little bit. So in Arche, this is exactly how the Greek translation, which is called the LXX or the Septuagint, which was a pre-Christian, pre-Jesus Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, they start Genesis 1-1 with in Arche. And that's in the beginning. In the beginning. And then you have the verb, ain, <clears throat> right here. And that's the, that, that's, that's the, that, that's the, the verb uh, was. In the beginning, was. And then you've got halagas, the word. In Arche, in halagas. Uh, kai halagas, in prostan theon, kai, kai theos, in halagas. So you basically have three uh, phrase, you have three clauses here that go together, right? You've got this first one here, in Arche, in halagas. Then you've got kai halagas, in prostan theon. And then you've got kai theos, in halagas. You've got these three phrases that make up the first verse. This one is non controversial. In the beginning, ain was halagas, the word. Kai halagas ein prostan theon. Okay, so kai is the, is, the, is the word and. It almost, it's normally translated and in the New Testament. There's no debate here. Uh, kai and halagas ein prostan theos. And the word halagas, and then we have ein again, was. And then we have here, let me get, is there another color I can use? <clears throat> the, the was, um, I'll use yellow again. Prostan theon. Uh, pros is an amazing word here. Uh, it can mean to, to look face to face. Uh, second John, I think it's second John or is it third John, when he says, I, I have much more I want to write with you, but I want to talk to you face pro, uh, face, pro, pros face, face to face. This is a word that can mean to or toward. Uh, it, it, it can be a relational word, uh, an intimate kind of word, a face to face type of word. Uh, but it's, it's often translated uh, with, which is, a, which is a fine translation of the word. Um, so, the word was ain prostan theon, with the God or towards the God, uh, the, toward God here. And you've got the definite article, the, ton, uh, linked with the word theon, the God. And then here you've got the controversial phrase, kai theos ain halagas. So, in Greek, the word order is not, is, does not take the same significance as word order does in English. Um, Rather, it's the, uh, the form of the article and the form of the word that tells you what position it plays in the sentence. So just follow me here for a second. You've got halagas, right? The same, the same thing we keep seeing here. We've got definite article, logos. Definite article, logos. Definite article, the, the word, the word, the word. This tells you, because it's in the nominative form, that this is the subject of the sentence, uh, of the phrase. So it's not, and God was the word, although that's the word order, and God was the word. It's, it's rather, this is the subject. So and uh, halagas, and the word ain was theos, God. Okay? Now, here is the million-dollar question. Why is it, why is it that the word God, let me, let me also make sure we got ain here again, the was each time. Why is it that the word God here has the definite article before theos, but this version of God, there is no definite article. There, there's no definite article before that word God. And they say a definite article means we're talking about capital G God. When you got a capital, when you got the, when you got the, when you got the definite article, that means capital G God. When there's no definite article, that means you're dealing with an indefinite article, which is a, the word a or an, a God. And if you don't know anything about Greek, and if you've never taken a Greek class, and you, you don't really understand this stuff, if, if the Jehovah's Witnesses standing at your door, they've been trained to talk about John 1.1 1, 1 and why they translate this verse so differently. And they will tell you, did you know, there's a definite article here, so we capitalize. There's no definite article here, so we give an indefinite article, a God, lowercase g. And they're just trying, they sound like they know what they're talking about. The very next verse, hutas ein in arche prostan theon. He was in arche, in arche, in the beginning, prostan theon, same phrase here with God or to or towards God. So, he being the word 
uh, was in the beginning with God. But when it refers to God the Father again, what do we notice? We've got the definite article is back, tan theon. So, of course, we would capitalize that capital as a capital letter. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So, when God refers to the Word, no definite article. When God refers to the Father, each time it's got a definite article. So, they're just saying we're being consistent with how we're translating this verse. Well, there's problems with that. We've already addressed some. Let's look at this. Verse 6. I'm going to use the New World Translation here. This is their, this is their Bible. In verse 6, you've got, uh, there was a man who was sent as a representative of God. His name was John. Do you see they capitalized the word God here? And in the Greek, it's paratheu. That's not a definite article. Uh, paratheu is not a definite article. Uh, instead, uh, that just means from God, sent, sent from God, uh, paratheu. So there, there's no definite article for the word theu, theos here, but they capitalize it anyway. Do you see? No definite article for God, and yet they capitalize God. Look at, the, look at verse 12 in the same chapter. We're told here, Whoever did receive him, he gave the authority to become God's children. And you see the God here is capital G. If you look back here, you've got the word techna, which is the word children, and you've got theu, but you'll notice there's no definite article before that word for God in the Greek. No, that's not a definite article. That's the word children, techna, theu, uh, genestai, uh, which means to become. You see the word genesis there, gena, genesis, be, to become. That's where this word is, so become God's children, technon. There's no definite article there. Verse 13, uh, the end, they were not born from man's will, but from God, from God. And you'll notice here in the Greek, ek is the word uh, from. So you'll see here, the Greek links together, but there is no definite article. Well, these are not matching up on my screen as they are here. So sorry if, that, if that's not working just right. But th there's no definite article here, um, but they capitalize God anyway. Look at verse 18, the same chapter. No man has ever seen God at any time. Well, in the Greek, you can see here the word God, theon, there's no definite article, and yet they translate it with a capital G, God. I mean, it wouldn't even make sense to translate this as a lowercase g, God, right? No one has ever seen a God. That's, no, no one translates it that way. So, when the New World says, hey, when there's no definite article, we don't capitalize the G in God. I'm sorry, they, they don't obey that rule four, more t four times in the rest of the same chapter. So it's, it's amazing. So, no, the, the, that, we don't need a definite article to translate that that way. You will notice here how they've also mistranslated something else, which is that the only begotten God who is at the Father's right side, He has made Him known. Uh, you've got here, where is that? I don't know if that'll match up on the screen. Monogenes Theos. Uh, Monogenes, so you've got mono one. Genes, uh, it couldn't be only begotten, it could be one and only, uh, but the monogenes Theus, the only begotten of God, the, the only begotten God or the one and only God, he has made him known. You, you'll see here the word exegesita. That is where we get the word exegesis, and it means to reveal, to make known, to explain. So we're told no one has ever seen God the Father, but the one and only God, the only begotten God who is in the uh, the the klopton, the 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 the, the bosom, the 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 chest, uh, to patras of the father. He has exegeted him. He has made him known. He has explained him, as the New World Translation says. But they they lowercase g, only begotten God here, even though there is absolutely no reason to do that in the Greek, because just like this God, this this word for God doesn't have a definite article. This one doesn't have a definite article, yet they translate one lowercase and one uppercase. I'm sorry, their theology is determining their translation method here, not the other way around. But if, that, if, that is, if that's confusing, it is confusing, I understand that. Let's get simple. Verse 3 of John 1 is where you want to go with the Jehovah's Witness. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Now you'll see here in the original language, panta is the word for all things. All things were made, again, it's all made um, through him, di altu. So, all things, di altu, through him, again, it's all were made. And chorus, uh, without, altu, him, again, it's all were made. And th th this here is uh, not, and then hen here, not even one thing, not one thing that has come into being. So, all things through him. Ponta di altu, all things through him, again it's were made, and chorus without altu, without him, came into being not one thing that has come into being. Um, 
Without him, Agenata Ude Hin Ha Geganin, without him came into being not one thing that has come into being. So, uh, that's, that's crystal clear, and even the, the New World Translation is pretty close on this one. So, let me give you an illustration borrowed from Greg Kokel, who wrote the Tactics book. Imagine you got a napkin, and you can write this down on a napkin while you are talking to, uh, to a Jehovah's Witnesses. And if they come back, maybe I'll get a chance to use this. We'll see. Imagine you write a napkin, and you split it down the middle, you write everything that exists at the top. And then imagine you write on one side all things that never came into being. So, all things, so this, is, this is everything that exists, on one side, all things that never came into being. On the other side, uh, and then you can put God under here. We're, and, uh, we're all going to agree on this one. God never came into being and he exists. Okay. Then on the other side of the napkin, you can probably guess all things that came into being. So that's your napkin. Everything that exists, on one side, things that never came into being, that's God. What, what things that exist have never come into being and have never started to exist? Well, that would have to be something eternal. That's God, only God. On the other side, all things that came into being that exist, well, what would that be? That's all created things, right? So I think so far, you and JWs are going to be in complete agreement on this point. You're going to be in complete agreement on that part of the chart. And here's where things start getting a little tricky. If you kind of zoom out here a little bit, you could add down here, would you agree, Jehovah's Witness, you could say, would you agree that all things that came into being, uh, these were all things that were created through Jesus, because John 1, 13, which we just looked at, said uh, all things came into being through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And they'll probably agree with you on that point. And then if you have a coin or maybe just a pen or something, you could get them to mark it, but you could give them a coin or something and say, okay, uh, where, where does Jesus fit on this chart? Okay? So I want you to put the coin on the side where Jesus belongs and just give them a second to look at it. Okay. Everything that exists is on this sheet. On one side, it's, some, it's all things that exist that never started, that never came into being, that never were created. On the other side, you've got things that exist that have come into being. So you've got God on one side and all created things on the other side. And if they're a Jehovah's Witness, where are they going to be tempted to put that quarter? They're going to be tempted to put that quarter over here on the side of created things that exist, things that have come into being, because they believe Jesus is the first and greatest created being of God. But... If they do that, challenge them to look back at John chapter 1, verse 3. And I'll put it on the screen here. We can look at the top for the ESV. Again, the watchtower is not, I mean, the, the, the New World Translation is not that much different. All things were made through him. And John knows that maybe that's not even clear enough. So he adds, to eliminate misunderstanding, he adds this. Without him, this has got to be the Word, Jesus, the one who was made flesh. So all things were made through Jesus. And without Jesus was not anything made that was made. So out of everything that was made, none of it was not made by Jesus. That's a double negative. Let me say it again. Without Jesus was not anything made that was made. In other words, everything that was made was made by Jesus. In other words, everything that came into being, everything that's created and came into being, came into being through Jesus. He created everything that came into a being. But that, what that does is that puts Jesus outside the realm of created things. You see, back to our sheet here. Everything that exists and has come into being, everything that's created came into being through Jesus. Everything. And that without Jesus, not one thing came into being that has come into being. Not one thing was created apart from him. As the ESV says it, without him was not anything made that was made. Everything that was made, everything that was made, everything that's in this box was made by Jesus, which means Jesus can't be in that box. Because if Jesus came into being, then that would have to mean Jesus created himself, which is neither what Jehovah's Witnesses teach, nor does it make any sense, because to create yourself, you have to be before you were. You have to exist before you exist. To bring yourself into existence, that's, that's nonsense. We don't believe in that. That's not possible. No one is teaching that on either side of this fence. So, Jesus cannot be in this box because everything that came into being came into being with him, through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So Jesus has to be in the box of things that exist that never came into being. But if Jesus is in this box, then he's equal to God the Father. He's co-equal and co-eternal with the Father. Do you see how this works? Just to go back to our John 1.1 1, 1 for a second. Now, just look at this. 
In Arche, in Halagos, in the beginning was the Word. Let me just point out one more thing I didn't mention so far. So I kept mentioning this word was. In the beginning was the Word. Okay? And it says it over and over again. And the Word was, prostanthaon, was with God. And the Word was God. Ain, ain, ain. Later, when he starts talking about created things, he starts using the word uh, agenita, to create, to, to bring it to being. Okay, so look at this. In Arche, in the beginning. It doesn't say in the beginning, the word came to be. Or he could have easily said in the beginning, the word was created. In the beginning, the word came into existence. The words he's going to use in a moment for, God, for Jesus creating things. He could use that right here, but he doesn't. He uses the word was. Now, what that means is, something being however you want to say it, the aorist tense or something like that. The, the tense that you're dealing with here means w however far back you go to the beginning, the word already was. So when the, when, when the, when the world was beginning, the, the, world, the word already was. When creation was, a, was, was at the beginning of its creation, the word already was, which means this puts the word before creation, before the beginning. When the beginning began, the word already was. Just like in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God didn't come into existence at the beginning. He was already there and he brought the beginning into existence. So the word already was as far back as you go to the beginning, and which means the word is eternal. He exists before, he exists outside of time, and he exists in the same status as God because the word was with God in eternity past, and the word was God in eternity past, and the word was before there was a beginning. The word was already was when the beginning began. And how is that the case? Uh, he was in the beginning with God because all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He is eternal like God the Father. So again, when it comes back to this sheet, we've got to put Jesus on the side of God, things that never came into being, not on the side of all things that came into being. But we're not done. Let me just mention here Andres Kostenberger, who wrote the notes for John's Gospel in the ESV Study Bible. This verse, John 1, 3, disproves any suggestion that the Word was created. For the Father would have had to do this by Himself, and John says that nothing was created that way, for without Him was not anything made that was made. Now, if we get lost in the whole argument about the definite article and all that stuff, um, let's look at John 20. Jesus appears before doubting Thomas. Put your finger here, see my hands, put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered Him, My Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Now let's look at the Greek of this translation. If I can find it here. Here we go. This is, this is so, so simple, so important. Um, you've got here Thomas Omos answered and said to him. Now look, look at this. Auto here. And we got that little squiggly line down below the, the b b down below there. It doesn't quite work. Auto is the masculine singular. Okay. This is the masculine singular. So Thomas answered and said to him. That is, he is talking to Jesus in the singular. He cannot be talking to anyone else. Right? Jesus said, do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas Thomas answered and said to him. So Thomas is directly and explicitly addressing Jesus. And what does he say? Ha, kurios, mu, kai, ha, theos, mu. Literally, this is the definite article in Greek. Ha, kurios, the Lord, mu, of me. Kai, we've seen earlier, is and. So the Lord of me, with the definite article, and ha, Theos mu, the God of me, my Lord and my God. But here, the definite article is explicitly in the word, with the word theos. And so what's going on here? Thomas is answering him. Remember, him has to be Jesus. Him is, is auto is Jesus. He calls Jesus the Lord of me, the God of me. That means Jesus is not a God. He is the God. He is God, capital G, applied to Jesus. And you say, well, what do they say about that? Quoting from Jehovah's Witnesses' app, which quotes the Watchtower from past years, quote, To Thomas, Jesus was like a god, lowercase g, especially in the miraculous circumstances that prompted his exclamation. What? He says, 
the God of me. And they say, no, he sees Jesus as a God, lowercase g. Do you see the problem here? They use the indefinite article a God right there, even though Thomas uses the definite article the God here. So you see, this is just straight up lying. I'm not saying that they know that they're lying. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Doesn't matter if they know or not. The point is they are. They are lying. They're telling you something that is objectively false about the basic nature of who Jesus is. Thomas says to him, alto, ha kuriasmu, the Lord of me, kai ha theosmu, the God of me, the God. You've got the definite article with God. There's no, no way this can be translated without the definite article. To translate it, a God, lowercase g. And they respond by saying, Thomas, to Thomas, Jesus was like a God. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, that's just lying through your teeth, whether you know it or not. A lie is a lie, whether you know it or not. And I, I think many of them probably do know, but I, I can't judge their hearts. I know that what they're doing is wrong, and it's clearly unbiblical, especially in the miraculous circumstances that prompted the exclamation. Some scholars suggest that Thomas, now listen to this, I mentioned this in, on Sunday. Some suggest Thomas may simply have made an emotional exclamation of astonishment spoken to Jesus, but directed to God. So either he is saying, OMG, like actually cursing in God's name, which is absurd, Thomas was a Jew. He grew up and in his culture for over a thousand years, for about 1,400 plus years. It had been one of the top 10 commandments of your nation is don't take the Lord's name in vain. Many Jews avoided saying the name of Yahweh altogether, right, to avoid accidentally saying his name in vain. It could be a capital offense uh, to misuse God's name. And you're telling me that Thomas, just like a modern American pagan person, just kind of flippantly says, my Lord, my God, in a flippant way as he's talking to you. Are you kidding me? That's the, you, you, are you so desperate to reject the divinity and the eternal div divinity of Jesus and the fact that he's the second person of the Trinity? Are you so passionate to reject that that you would prefer that interpretation over the one that's obviously correct? I'm, I'm being serious right here. And then you've got here also... How can something, how can something be, let's look at the words here, spoken to Jesus. So at least they admit that he is talking to Jesus. There's no way around it. The word alto is used, masculine singular, answering Jesus. So he has to be, they admit, okay, yeah, he's speaking to Jesus when he says, my Lord and my God, the Lord of me and the God of me. Well, they say that the words are not actually directed to Jesus. They're directed to God. So how can something be spoken to Jesus, but directed to God? Um, no, no, the Greek won't allow it. Common sense won't allow it. No, he calls Jesus his God, not a God, the God of me. Okay, let's move on to Colossians chapter 1. This is one of the most famous just translations, mistranslations of the, the, the Watchtower, uh, of the New World Translation of Scripture. And um, I looked at that video. You know, you can see in some of the older editions of this verse, they would put the word other in brackets one times... I don't know if I highlighted all of them. I don't think I highlighted all of them because it, it appears four times in here, I think. Where am I missing the other ones? Yeah, here it is. I didn't highlight all of them properly. And there's one more, I think, in here. Here it is. So there are earlier editions of this in the Watchtower magazine. I, I, I keep saying that. In the New World Translation, earlier editions, they actually put brackets around the word others. And um, that tells you it's not in the original Greek. But I think it was around the 2006 edition. I could be wrong. Uh, it may be even the 1984 edition. They just took the brackets out. Just saying, yeah, this is in the Greek. But the, why, why did the early editions put a bracket saying it's not in the Greek? And then why would they take the brackets out since the Greek hasn't changed? Here's how they interpret it. New World Translation 2013. He is the image of the invisible God, Jesus. The image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Because by means of him, all other things were created in the heavens, etc., visible, invisible. All other things have been created through him and for him. Also, he is before all other things, and by means of all other things, uh, by means of him, all other things were made to exist. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry. Uh, that's, that's a horrifying false translation of this text. And the, the fact that their early editions had brackets around the word other all four times tells you that they know that's not in the Greek. The word other is not in the Greek. It's just the word panta. It's just the word all. It's just, it's just the word all. There is no other. <laughs> they, they have to add the word other because otherwise their theology does not work in, in these verses. Four times Paul denies the theology of the Jehovah's Witnesses, and four times they add a word to make Jesus the first and greatest created being. And you know how they justify it? Verse 15. Verse 15, the blue part, is how they justify it. They say, well, it's, in context, it has to mean all other things because it says he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. They got no problem with that. So Jesus is here. 
Jesus, he is the image of the visible God. Then we're told that he is the firstborn of all creation, which has to mean that all other things were created. He was the first created being, and then all other things were created through him. All other things, other things, other things. And that's their justification. And if you don't know anything about what's going on here, and it's your first time looking through this argument, you might be persuaded. Oh, that makes sense. He's called the firstborn, the prototokos of, the, of creation. Uh, he's the f- very firstborn being. God created him first, and then he created everything else. So that justifies adding the word other to the text. And that's what the text really meant originally. It could sound powerful if you've never, if you've never thought through it, if, it's, if, if you're new to this thing. Okay, but let's stop for a second. <clears throat> Once again, let's... Uh, Let's look at this. Let's look at the, let's look at the Greek again. We're, we're going to Psalm 89. Just follow me here, okay? We're, we're missing some words here. I have found David my servant. So the subject here is David. Or God is speaking, but the one he's talking about is David, King David. And this is written after David has been long dead in the exile period. I, now just f- follow me. You've got to follow the word him here because I think him is always referring to David as we go. So I found David my servant. With holy oil, I have anointed him. So who is him? Him is David, the Davidic king. Okay, so that my hand has, uh, shall be established with him, David. My arm shall also shall strengthen him, David. The enemy shall not outwit him, David. The wicked shall not humble him, David, the Davidic king. Verse 23, I will crush his foes before him. That's the, the Davidic king. Strike down those who, who hate him. That's David. My faithfulness and my steadfast love shall be with him, the Davidic king. And... In my name shall his horn be exalted. That's David. Verse 25, I will set his hand on the sea, his right hand on the rivers. He, that's got to be the Davidic anointed messianic type king. He shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Now look at verse 27. He has to be David, right? It has to be the Davidic king in context. And I will make him, this is still the Davidic king. Davidic king, David. I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Now you see here the Greek word, this is the Greek translation, the LXX, the Septuagint. The Greek translation here for firstborn is the Greek word prototokon, the firstborn, okay? Now, are we talking here about literal chronological birth order? And that's what the Jehovah's Witnesses are doing with this word. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Paul's background when he writes Colossians 1 is the Old Testament. When he's talking about Jesus and the Davidic king and all that kind of stuff, messianic language, the Christ language, he's referring back to Old Testament categories over and over again. This is the one he's clearly referring to in Colossians 1.15. He uses the same Greek word, prototokon. What does he say? David's the firstborn, the prototokon, and then he defines, the psalmist defines what that means. It doesn't mean the first human or the firstborn. Or, it means what? The greatest king the highest of the kings of the earth. So we know for sure from context that firstborn is defined right here. And what does it mean? It means the greatest king. Now, this means that God's anointed the Davidic line of kingship as prototokon, the firstborn, which means the greatest king of the earth, the highest of the kings of the earth. So here's what we're told. The word prototokon does not refer to chronology but to rank or status. Would you agree here? So was David even the first king of Israel, of the United Kingdom? No, who was that? That was Saul, the guy who came before him. Was David even the firstborn physically in his own family amongst his brothers? No, what was he? He was the lastborn. This this is not about chronology. It's not about order. It's not about when in time someone became something. No, it's about rank and status. The firstborn was the status position. It was a, it was a, it was a status position. The, the, when Esau wanted the birthright, when he wanted the blessing, he was wanting the, he wanted the status that that he you know, he was firstborn literally. But this but this but the status of firstborn was given to his younger brother Jacob. Right. So it's not about chronology. It's about status. It's about rank. And it means first amongst the kings of the earth. That's the background, I am convinced, because that same Greek word to Colossians 1. So look at Colossians 1 in the Greek. We don't have to read all this in Greek, but I just want to show you a couple things. Um, so, uh, right here, prototakos, pases, uh, 
Tisseus. That's hard to say. He's the firstborn of all creation. And then we're told here, through him, all things, tapanta, uh, things in heaven, arenois, and things, pro, uh, ponton, tapanta, passes. These are all, just all. There's, there's no all other things. It's just the word all things were made through him. So ESV is right. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. That means he's the, he, he, he ranks above all else. He's prototakos. He is first above all. He is he's above everything else. He's preeminent above everything else. For by him all things were created. All things were created through him and for him. He's before all things. In him all things hold together. And so you see here clearly, uh, Bruce Metzger, the word other has been unwarrantably inserted four times. It is not present in the original Greek, the word other, all other things. and was obviously used by the translators in order to make the passage refer to Jesus as being on par with other created things. Continuing, as a matter of fact, the ancient Colossian heresy, which Paul had to combat in Colossians, resembled the opinion of the modern Jehovah's Witnesses, ironically. For some of the Colossians advocated the Gnostic notion that Jesus was the first of many other created intermediaries between God and men. For the true meaning of Paul's exalted description of the Son of God, therefore the above translation must be read without the fourfold addition of the word other. So, the Jehovah's Witnesses are, again, simply wrong in taking their translation of this text and adding in the words, all other things were created through him, all other things have been created through him and for him. He's before all other things, and by means of him, all other things came into existence. This is a perversion of God's word, the New World Translation. It's a perversion of God's word. Over and over, they change the wording so that Jesus does not take on the status that the Bible is to give him. We can give other examples of this, but I think we will stop here. I hope that was helpful. I hope to do Mormonism and Catholicism later.